So the book uh, Fewer, Bigger, Bolder was, uh, came out of the realization that as we, my co-author and I, from very different perspectives, he was in packaged goods, he was a practitioner, I worked with technology companies and I was an academic, but we observed the same phenomenon and that is that companies pursue growth in every direction. And uh, you know, as, as one of the CEOs we talked to said, I never met a revenue dollar that I didn't like. Um, and in this process of undisciplined pursuit of growth, they end up becoming too complex, too unwieldy and spreading themselves too thin. And yet, every incremental move they make seems logical. You know, you want more products, you want more customers, you want more markets, but when you add it all up, uh, you end up with complexity and you end up with city. So there's this very interesting idea that, you know, growth is like cholesterol. There's good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. So mm -hmm. it's not all growth is good. There is a concept of what we call a toxic growth. So what's an example of toxic growth? you acquire a company that brings in you know, a little bit more revenue but adds a lot more complexity to your operations and is not very profitable and it's a big headache and requires a lot of management's time or a marginal product that you launch that or you get into businesses or, in, or markets where you don't have expertise. So the thesis of the book really is using a disciplined approach to growth. That's why we call the book from mindless expansion to focused growth. Uh, and in, in that process, narrowing down your bets, you know, making fewer bets, but uh, focusing where you can win, and then executing like hell against those priority, and then distorting resources against fewer priority. Okay. So that's the essence of why we call the book Fewer, Bigger, and Bolder. Tell us about Focus 7, your seven-step model, what it's about, and why it's important. So as, as we began to think about this, this process of discipline growth, what we felt was that there was a lot of writing and a lot of thinking around strategy and big picture ideas and what focus looks like. But we wanted to really give an actionable step-by-step -step roadmap on how do you actually make discipline growth happen. Mm. So focus seven, the reason it's called focus seven is that there are seven steps in the, in the framework. We go all the way from you know, understanding how to discover where the opportunities are to then focusing in on the areas that you want to play and bet on, so that's the strategy piece. Then uh, articulating that message and that vision and a rallying cry for the, for the organization because that's another piece that gets lost. Sometimes strategy doesn't get translated to the troops. Mm -hmm. And then the steps in execution. How do you align the organization? How do you sort of uh, simplify uh, decision making and execution? And how do you measure progress? So we go all the way from vision and strategy to sort of implementation execution. Uh, so it's meant to be a sort of comprehensive roadmap that covers all of the steps that a business leader would need to, to go through with a real emphasis on how to make things happen. So our sort of differentiation in the book, what we really believe the contribution is, it's really the tactics. Everything from strategy to tactic, tactics and people and organization and metrics. So really, how do you actually make uh, these, these things, uh, discipline growth happen? What is enlightened profitability? You use that term and it's fascinating. Tell us about that. Well, enlightened profitability is the idea that you have good profits and enlightened profitability and yet you have sustained profits. So profitability can be enlightened because it is something that will sustain over time and it's not, you know, for example, if you run a promotion and you sell more stuff, uh, you can make profits in the short run, but those are myopic profits. They are not enlightened profits. Then I think there is an angle beyond that, which is that enlightened profits are not only good for the company, but they're good for society. They're good for the mm -hmm. community. So it's also that you're not in this process either destroying the environment or right. sort of crossing ethical boundaries. So I'd say it's a combination of uh, sustained profits, sustainable profits, and sustainability. What are some of the lenses that you talk about through which companies should be looking specifically for opportunities? Right. So lenses is the, uh, you know, the, the, the metaphor that we use, that when you're looking at a landscape and you want to zero in on sort of a particular object, you use a zoom lens, right? And the zoom lens really brings into focus what you specifically want to look at while 
you know, the other things in the background recede. And in fact, that is the idea of focus, that you want to distort resources against few priorities. But the question is, how do you pick those few? How do you prioritize? So lenses are dimensions or vectors along which a business can think of its, uh, an organization can think about its business. For example, if you look at the early days of Dell, Dell's success was based on the fact that they went direct to the customer, that they did not use middlemen. So the lens through which they looked at their business was channels. How do you get to the customer? Mm -hmm. That was their differentiation. On the other hand, if you look at a company like Vir the Virgin Group, mm -hmm. you know, it seems like a very unfocused company. They yeah. didn't, you know, everything from space to colas to mortgage to, you know, all, to, over. all over the place. <gasps> Uh, but as I was talking to their chief marketing officer, you know, he explained to me, he says, we are a branded venture capital group. The lens through which we look at our business is the brand. He said, the only questions we ask when we get into a business, new business are that, are we able to take a disruptive and challenging role in that industry? You know, and how are we going to shepherd the brand? So it's all about Virgin stands for a certain set of values. Mm. You know, the upstart, the rebel, mm. the uh, upsetting the status quo. So he says that as long as those rules are satisfied, it doesn't matter if we're making planes or trains or automobiles or cola. Yeah. So uh -huh. the lens through which they look at their brand is, the, is, is, their business is the brand. So a brand can be a lens, a channel can be a lens, you know, a customer segment can be a lens. Mm -hmm. For example, take the largest and most profitable car rental company in the U.S., which people don't even know, is Enterprise. Is it Enterprise? And okay. It, and, and the reason is because Enterprise has focused like a laser beam on a particular customer, which is the replacement car market. Ah. It's for people whose cars have been broken or, or mm. actually don't own a car, hmm. not the people who rent at airports. So they are in neighborhoods. There are 7,000 you know, stores in neighborhoods, and their partnerships are not with the airlines and hotel or travel companies, but with insurance companies and car repair shops and dealerships. So they've embedded themselves into the fabric of neighborhoods, and, and so, so their market share in that replacement car segment is more than 80%. So their lens is the occasion or the customer. Yeah. So and these we'll are, pick you up. Yeah, and we'll pick you up. Why? Because we're in the neighborhood. Yeah. You know? And why? Because wow. you don't have a car. Hmm. So we do need to pick you up. Yeah. So every business, as it looks at, you know, it's, it, there are products, channels, customers, markets, business models and processes and many different ways in which you can think about your business. So you have to pick one or two of those dimensions and say that's going to be the way we are going to look at our business and that's how we're going to prioritize, how we're going to focus. You talk a lot about ownership and giving the right people freedom to pursue these focuses. Tell us a little bit about why that's important. When you think about most big companies, corporations, uh, people come in, they do their job, they punch the clock, and they go home. They don't feel yeah. that they are really very important in the scheme of things. They feel they're a cog in a wheel, and uh, which is very different from the environment that you have in a startup firm. Because in a startup firm, uh, it's like a, a, a CEO of a startup told me, he says, you can either be uh, on the Queen Elizabeth too, or you can be in a rubber dinghy. <laughs> so when you're in a rubber dinghy, every wave hits you. You, you, you feel yeah. it, right? But when you're in a giant you know, liner, you don't even know if the ship is uh, afloat or not, or is moving or not, because it's so, you're so isolated from the waves that are hitting the company. So in a startup, there's a much greater sense of ownership and involvement and engagement um, and what we feel is that that entrepreneurial spirit, that energy, that passion can actually be unlocked inside a big company. Mm -hmm. So there is, you know, you can have corporate innovators just like you can have uh, entrepreneurs. But what you need to do is in order to make them feel like owners, you have to give them rope. You have to give them resources. You have to give them freedom mm -hmm. to execute. And that's the idea of sort of what we call the blank checks, which is finding a few good people and then really betting on them by giving them practically infinite resources to do, pursue, you know, so we call it, you know, unimaginable goals mm -hmm. with unlimited resources and an impossibly short time frame. <gasps> so, so essentially you, you push, you say, all we're gonna look at is the results and these are the things you sign up for, but you know, pursue because mm -hmm. budgets and constraints really tie people up in knots yeah. and companies. So, but you can't do this with every employee in the company. You know, not everybody is cut out to be an entrepreneur. Right. So that's why we again say focus, you know, find 
the 10 percent or the 5 percent of the people who are really sort of the entrepreneurs that are, that are hidden inside your company, bet on them, give them the freedom, give them the resources, and you can create that sense of ownership and passion. And you know, so this is what we call like unlocking the potential of the people that mm -hmm. work for you. Because uh, you know, I remember uh, a, an employee at Ford who said uh, he was worked on the assembly line. He says, for 25 years, I gave you my my hands, but if you had asked for my mind and my heart, I would have given it to you. Oh wow! That's so we're powerful. not using we're not using the true potential mm. of people in large companies. So that's the idea of blank checks: is to really sort of find a few people, empower them, give them the resources, and then measure the results. Keep a tight leash on the results, but that but not measure the process. Mm. That's the idea. So, what's the one big idea that you want people to take away from this book? I think the biggest idea behind the book is the concept that less is more. That growth is not about doing more. Growth is about being better mm. at fewer things. And that's overturns a very basic assumption about growth. You know, because growth is about adding. You know, we say yeah. no, growth is about deleting. Wow. It's about firing customers who are unprofitable. So getting out of products and businesses that you have no business being in. It's about finding where you can really win and doubling down on those bets. So that's the counterintuitive idea of yeah. growth that really is the key insight in the book. The rally and cry. What's, what is that and what's the importance of that? The essence of the rallying cry is the idea that corporate strategy and vision sometimes become too abstract and are lost in the thin air of the boardroom. Mm -hmm. um, so the people in the front line, the people who are actually going to do the work, the customer service representatives, the salespeople, the, the engineers, the, you know, the people in the assembly line, they need to be able to understand where are we marching? You know, what's, mm. what's, what, where is north? You know, what's the north star? So that is the purpose of a rallying cry. It's, a, it's sort of a simplified expression of a vision that everybody can relate to and understand. And it has a very powerful aligning effect if done right. So I'll give you a quick example of a company that I work with. And we were talking about how to grow the company and how to take it sort of to the next level. They're about, they were about 100 million in revenues. So I just came up with the idea. I said, let's do five by five, which is 500 million in five years. Hmm. So basically, it's a five, five X growth. So five by five is something that everybody sort of jump down to and could identify with. And now it has really become the rallying cry because now what we've done is saying, okay, we're gonna be 500 million in five years. Let's work backwards from there and see, you know, how much does the US have to do? How much does this product have to do? So everybody has their goals, but they're all marching towards a clearly defined destination and milestones towards the destination. Mm -hmm. So the rallying cry is, I'll give you an analogy. It's like if you have a bunch of iron filings and they're randomly arranged, you put a magnet and they all align themselves ah. to north, right? Yeah. So, so that's like people in an organization. So the rallying cry really aligns people around a vision. So once you've figured out where you want to focus, once you've figured out your strategy, then you need to express it in really simple ways, either in terms of a number or a, or a, or a slogan or you know, some sort of acronym yeah. that people can hang on to mm. and relate to because that has a very powerful aligning effect. And what are some of the pitfalls that you warn about in the book? One very important question is that we, we argue that you need to focus your resources on fewer products, fewer customers, and so on. But let's say you have 200 brands and you have five or 10 as the focus brand. What do you do with the other 180, 190? Yeah. Do you like get rid of them? Do you sell them off? No. It's, it's so the, because if, if the five or 10 brands are your head and the rest is the tail, before you chop off your tail, make sure your head is big enough. Right, because you're going to, <laughs> so in that portfolio of, you really need to think about what are some of the products or markets that can be managed relatively autonomously. So you delegate to the local teams or to the, so they run almost like startups. Uh, but the management team, the leadership team only focuses on the fo focus areas. Okay. So that's one important thing yeah. is sort of, don't lose sight of the fact that we're not telling you to get rid of everything else, yeah. but really, focus the management attention and resources and investments on the focus areas. Another key pitfall is that 
you can't scale something that's broken. So, mm -hmm. you know, you first have to get your model right. You have to mm -hmm. get your, and that's where we, are, we, we recommend people be, they do experimentation, you know, tinker around, experiment. And once you figure out what works, then scale it. Mm -hmm. So we call that pitfall, you know, fix before you scale. Because if you scale, you know, something that's not working, it's like you've got a car who's, which is kind of shaky and you press the accelerator, you're just gonna break it apart or end up in an accident. Yeah. So, uh, so those are some of the things to, to, to watch out for. Um, as, as you think about focus growth. Tell us about how businesses can innovate in a very hyper-connected technical world. So if you think about what's going on in, in, um, across industries, there are, there are sort of connectivity is a secular disruptive force. It's disrupting mm -hmm. every industry. Connectivity is in the net. What I mean by connectivity is the fact that Consumers, customers, businesses um, are are globally now connected to one grid. Um, networks are, are global now in their reach. So what that does, it allows some really interesting business models to be created. You know, it allows the creation of you know concepts like Uber or Airbnb, mm -hmm. and you know. So so if you look at the the taxi business is being disrupted, the hotel business is being disrupted, mm -hmm. the automotive business is being disruptive. Mm -hmm. So you know, the education business is being disrupted, retail is being disrupted. So you pick any industry the same forces of globalization and networking and technology are disrupting. Um, so hyperconnectivity leads to disruption of existing ways of doing business. The way that you can deal with this is, um, is you know, there are a number of strategies that I talk about, but the one, you know, one is to sort of uh, uh, disrupt yourself before you get disrupted, right? And, and that is by actually creating experimental businesses or business models that are you know disruptive to your core business good example of that is what Netflix did I mean think about how they effectively killed their DVD rental business right. by going to streaming and yeah. if you remember their stock crashed and people were very critical yeah. but look where they are now and because they saw it yeah. coming they didn't they what they did to blockbuster mm. they did to themselves ah but before it was too late so that's one strategy. The other strategy is to actually acquire a disruptor. Uh, mm. All state wins, goes and buys insurance, ah. so so that they can learn and keep that business at arm's length and let it do the direct to customer model while they still pursue their uh, business. Another approach is to actually build some of those capabilities of the disruptors into your own business. For ex example, you know the cab companies are complaining about Uber. Well, why not learn from Uber and build your own app? that allows you to find where a ca taxi is and how long it's gonna take to get there. So that's the idea of sort of, you know, learning from the disruptors and building some of those capabilities. Mm. How do you get the right people in a learning organization and how do you encourage them to keep learning? One of my friends who was a CEO uh, said, I figured out what it takes to be a CEO. It's quite simple, it's only three things. You know, find the, hire the right people, put them in the right jobs, and get the hell out of the way, <laughs> right? So, but easier said than done. Yeah. So, um, I think the first part, which is find the right people, actually is a very, very important insight. Which is that, as a CEO or as a business leader, the, for perhaps the most impact you can have on your business is talent, identifying talent, and sort of being on the lookout and being a talent mm -hmm. magnet. In fact, that's one of the things you look at when I, I work with a lot of startups and I, when I look at the CEO, the founder, I ask, is, is this person a talent magnet? Can they attract good people? Can they inspire people to just, so that's the first part is sort of, because you know, I, I tell people, you don't hire people, you hire an attitude. Mm -hmm. and, and, and your attitude, mm -hmm. I believe, is a good predictor of your altitude. You know, how, how far you're gonna go or how high you're gonna go in life. So people are, built a particular way, so you have to identify those right skills. But then you have to create an environment that encourages them to continue to ask questions, to continue mm. to learn, to continue yeah. to sort of, you know, uh, so that it's a safe, the, the environment is a safe place. So, so this is what we call a culture of innovation, mm. creating an environment where, you know, it is the, the, through a combination of money, love, and development, encouraging people to take risks uh, to, to, to ask questions, to break stuff even if they have to. So that's what encourages people to sort of continue to take, to learn and to take risks. Mm -hmm. And then once they do reach success, figuring out how to reward success and very importantly, how to reward failure. Mm -hmm. Because 
there will be some failure. In rewarding failure, the thing to understand is that you don't reward just the outcome, you reward the effort. I uh, see. Because if companies don't know how to reward failure, then people will only look for success and innovation requires, almost demands some failure. Mm. So those are some of the tips on uh, how do you bring the right people, motivate them to learn and retain them. What has made you so successful in your career? And then what do you tell young people, your students at Kellogg School of Management, your daughter, how do you tell them to rise to the top in the business world today? The most important thing in life in your career is finding your passion and then pursuing it. Because mm -hmm. really someone told me that success is, if you want a formula for success, is the intersection of what you like to do, what you're good at doing, what you get paid well to do, and what makes a difference to the world. So if you are fortunate enough to sort of get three out of four, or you know, <laughs> you know, even two out of four, yeah. uh, because some people are very passionate and they like to do certain things, but they may not be good at them, or they may be good at them and be passionate, but they may not get paid well to do, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so the starving artists, for instance. Right. So I was very fortunate that um, I found my groove, I found something, I'm passionate about technology and how it impacts business. That's all I've, so I followed my own sort of prescription of focus. That's all I focus on. I only work with technology companies. And so after 25 years of doing this, you kind of become an expert. You know what the definition of an expert is, that you, they know more and more about less and less until they know everything about nothing. So, so that's the idea of focus. So, so I've built up an, you know, a network and a set of clients and that, um, that, that I'm, I'm pretty good at what I do. But also it's really exciting. It's something that excites me because technology changes so quickly. There's always something new to learn. Mm -hmm. It's the very definition of sort of a learning uh, environment that you become obsolete if you don't change. Um, so. I would say find your passion. And by the way, sometimes you don't find your passion, your passion finds you. Mm -hmm. But you have to be listening. You have to, you know, you have to listen to weak signals from the universe that, that sort of sort of tug you in a particular direction. Mm -hmm. But then you need to follow that passion regardless of what society tells you, what other people tell you, because you really have to have the guts, you know, to, to pursue that. So in I like to summarize all of this by saying that if passion is your sail, you know, and, and, and humility is your anchor, you know, and uh, then, then you, will, you will sail the ship of, ship of life really well.